Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be talking about the symptoms of magnesium deficiency. In fact, we're going to be talking about a lot more than that. We'll be talking about the symptoms, I'll be talking to you about the causes, I'll be talking, about, talking to you about why testing is not very accurate, and how to fix the problem with either supplements or food. Now, what I want to start off by saying is that this is a very common nutrient deficiency. In fact, next to maybe vitamin D, there are a huge number of people that suffer from magnesium deficiency. The number, the estimate, it's hard to get an exact figure on this, obviously, but some studies suggest it's anywhere to between 40% to 50% of people do not have enough magnesium inside of their bodies right now and may be suffering from the symptoms we're gonna talk about right now. So let's jump into that. Now, some of the most common symptoms associated with magnesium deficiency include about the six or seven we're gonna talk about here. But what I want you to realize is that there are many others and that's because magnesium impacts over 300 cellular pathways inside of your body. So it's really hard to say, well, if your magnesium level is low, you're gonna experience this symptom, like your eyes are gonna get bigger. It doesn't really work that way. Instead, you get a lot of generalized, low-grade symptoms that just make it harder to live life day to day. Okay, so let's talk about these right now. So one of the most common, I would say, is fatigue. Um, in addition, you might have issues sleeping or suffer from insomnia. You could also experience muscle cramps. Now, this is a big one. Muscle cramps, if you have any sort of muscle cramp, like you wake up in the middle of the night because your muscle's cramping or whatever it is, uh, maybe you have an eye twitch, something like that, look at magnesium. Almost always you can solve those problems by taking sometimes high doses of magnesium. Constipation is another symptom you may experience if, as your magnesium level decreases. Depression or other mood disorders can also occur. You can may experience a decrease in appetite, although I don't see that very common, but this one I also see very frequently, and that is headaches and or migraines. So you can think of magnesium as having a calming effect on the body. So if you have a hyper excited state of any sort, magnesium can kind of bring that state down. So headaches, migraines, muscle cramps, right? Those are excited states. You can kind of bring that down, calm your body with magnesium. Now, if this wasn't enough to want to get you to look at optimizing your magnesium, then perhaps you should take a look at the increased risk of diseases you get by not having enough magnesium. And that includes an increased risk of diabetes mellitus, which is type two, an increased risk of insulin resistance, which by the way, leads to weight gain, and an increased risk of heart disease because of the calcification that it can occur inside of your arteries. So no matter what, dealing with magnesium deficiency is a big deal and something that should be top of mind for you if you're listening to this. Now the question is, why is this so common? Because it is, it's very common. Like I said, 40 to 50% of people have it, that's huge, right? They don't have a gross deficiency, but they have suboptimal levels. Now, I would say the number one cause is most likely stress. The more stress that you are under, the faster you deplete magnesium, and the less magnesium you, you have, the less resilient to stress that you are, which creates a cycle that continues in perpetuity. It's a vicious cycle, right? The more stress you're under, the more magnesium deficient you become, the more easily you are susceptible to stress, the more magnesium deficient you become, etc. So stress is absolutely, from a physiologic standpoint, probably the number one cause of magnesium deficiency and the reason that people should pretty much always consider taking magnesium supplements or concentrating their diet to, to include magnesium-rich foods. Now, I eat a whole food diet, I try to live a very healthy lifestyle, and I still take magnesium supplements very frequently for this very reason, because no matter how healthy you are, you're gonna get under stress, right? You're, that's just gonna happen to you. Day to day, it's, you're, gonna be, you're gonna experience stress, it's gonna impact your body, end of story. Now, another big reason, I would say probably number two is diet. Now, the more processed foods that you consume, the more likely you are to develop deficiencies in multiple nutrients, especially magnesium. So yeah, deep diet is definitely up there. What people don't realize also is that prescription medications can also cause this, especially medications that target blood pressure or diuretics. Like they're kind of the same class most often. But if it's impacting your kidneys or your blood pressure, there's a high probability that is increasing magnesium excretion. So you're getting rid of magnesium faster. And that's not a good thing. So this is why taking you always need to be conscious of your magnesium level because stress is happening in your life. Now, if you're eating a whole food diet, that might be okay, but you might be taking medications which also cause it to become depleted. So no matter what, you're gonna have to keep an eye on it. And then I would say lastly, another big cause is stomach acid. So decreased stomach acid. And this occurs primarily 
because people are taking a lot of proton pump inhibitors or acid blockers for acid reflux. So a lot of people do not have adequate concentrations of stomach acid, which increases the excretion of magnesium inside of the gut because you can't absorb it as well. In addition, a lot of patients have thyroid problems, which also decreases stomach acid and will lead to multiple nutrient deficiencies, including magnesium. So you might be thinking, all right, this is all great. This, I'm following everything. Now, I think I have some of these symptoms. Maybe I should go get tested for it. And I, I like where your head's at. Unfortunately, it's not gonna help you much. And that's because all the tests that we have for magnesium are not very accurate. If you were to go into your doctor and ask him or her, hey, can you test my magnesium? They would order something called a serum magnesium. Now here's the problem with, actually, I'm gonna tell you the problem by explaining to you why RBC magnesium may be the solution to that problem. So RBC magnesium is a more accurate test because it assesses the amount of magnesium found inside of red blood cells. And the reason that this test exists is because people, doctors know, researchers know, that it's really hard to adequately assess magnesium concentration by looking at the blood. And that's because the blood is just a highway. It's a highway that takes nutrients where it needs to go. Yes, it brings oxygen, nutrients, all sorts of things, um, everything that your body needs to the cells where they need to go. The problem is the majority of magnesium inside of your body is found inside of the cells. And your body is, your cells are really, really, really good at hanging on to that magnesium because they need it. It's so critical to the function of intracellular processes. It do, they don't wanna get rid of it. So what we do is we say, hey, let's look at the blood and we're gonna assume that if there's a certain amount inside of the blood, well, we can make a guess about how much is actually in the cells. And we're not very good at that. And it doesn't work that way. Um, I've had nephrologists explain this to me, but the, it, there's a, a gradient that exists between the cells and the blood such that it's a logarithmic difference. So if you see decreases in serum magnesium levels in the serum, that means the cells are very depleted. Like it's not like a linear, it's not a linear relationship. It's a logarithmic relationship. So you can't count on the serum a magnesium level to tell you how much is in the blood or how much is in your how much is in your cells. Now RBC magnesium attempts to solve that problem but it's still not very accurate. So all in all it's generally not a good idea to, or it's not a very accurate way to assess your your whole body magnesium by looking at these lab tests. Now where I do think they are beneficial is if you are going to say okay I have these symptoms of magnesium deficiency I'm going to get these tests as a baseline and I am now going to increase my consumption either through supplements or food and then I'm going to retest in a couple months and see what happens. Now they won't tell you how much is in your cells but they might give you an idea if these symptoms we talked about are related to magnesium and not something else, right? Because insomnia can be caused by a lot of things. Fatigue can be caused by a lot of things. So testing can kind of help you figure out if it really is the magnesium that's causing the issue but don't use it as a way to help you diagnose the problem. That is not gonna work very well. Now, okay, what do you do if you have this problem? How do you solve it? How do you get more magnesium? Well, I would say one of the easiest ways for sure would be to just take supplements, but I'm also gonna give you some food sources and we're gonna talk about why that's probably not gonna be sufficient by itself. So let me first start by saying the best whole body magnesium supplement that you can use is magnesium glycinate. Some people pronounce this magnesium glyconate, we're talking about the same thing here. Now, if you're going to use magnesium supplements, you're gonna to wanna to look for somewhere between 100 to 300 milligrams taken each day. Okay, that's usually a pretty good starting dose. Now realize though, that this dose can go all the way to 1,000 milligrams or even higher, right? You can take a lot of magnesium and be okay with it. It's really, really, really hard to take too much magnesium because the worst thing that happens is you just develop a little bit of loose stools. And as soon as you back up on your magnesium, that goes away, so that's not really an issue. So magnesium glycinate at about 100 to 300 milligrams per day, if combined with food sources, will get you to where you need to go. Now on average, you, your body needs about 300 milligrams per day. That's kind of the, the, the goal to shoot for, or the amount that you need to shoot for. But usually people are consuming some amount from their food and some amount from the supplements, so you can combine those things together. Now what I want you to do is avoid any source of magnesium oxide. That is a very cheap, bad source of magnesium, it's not gonna be absorbed very well, and most because it's cheap, it's in most supplements. So if you're taking a magnesium supplement, make sure it's not just filled with magnesium oxide because it's, you're, not, you're just wasting your money, okay? Get something that's a little bit better. You're gonna to have to spend more money, but that's because it's gonna work more effectively inside of the body. Now, what if you wanted to get magnesium through your diet? Well, here are the best foods to eat if that's what you wanna do. Now, I put this percentage right here, you'll see these percentages on the side. That percentage indicates how much 
um, that represents of the total amount that you need each day. So for instance, the two best by far, the best sources of magnesium are pumpkin seeds and chia seeds. Pumpkin seeds per serving provide you 30%, 37% of the total amount that you need each day. And chia seeds provide you 26% of the total amount that you need each day. Now for perspective, that means you need, that means you need about three servings of pumpkin seeds or four servings of chia seeds to get to that 300 milligram value. That's why I said, how many of you are eating that many pumpkin seeds or chia seeds each day? Probably not a lot, right? So that's why I said supplements make a lot of sense, at least to just get make up the difference. Um, now, some of these other ones are, still contain a high amount of magnesium, but compared to the pumpkins and chias, not very much. So we have spinach, almonds, peanuts, black beans, edamame, peanut butter, and potatoes. Um, spinach has like 19%, almonds have 19%, all the way down to potatoes, which have 12%. So you can see you need quite a few potatoes to reach that magnesium threshold, the amount that you need every single day. And it's not feasible probably for most of you to be eating eight or nine potatoes a day. That's just the way that it is. That's why I recommend combining supplements and foods together. Get the total amount of magnesium that you need. Have a magnesium supplement that you can lean on, especially when you notice you're getting more stress, if you're getting more headaches, if you're getting more muscle twitches, if you're having problems sleeping. Don't be afraid to take 200, 300, 400 milligrams of magnesium in the glycinate form. And honestly, if, you're, if your problem is related to magnesium, you should see a pretty rapid improvement. I'm a big fan of recommending magnesium. I've seen a lot of success in using it. So if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comments below. I try to get to those questions as frequently as I can. Um, and otherwise, that's all I have for you guys today. So I'll see you in the next one.